Logan Phillips is a bilingual poet and DJ. He is author of Sonoran Strange from West End Press, University of New Mexico Press 2015, and has worked on a wide range of performance and education projects in the U.S., Mexico, and beyond. Currently, he is an MFA candidate at the University of Arizona in Tucson, where he lives with his family. More at Phillips' website, www.dirtyverbs.com. Huzzle of a Borderlands Childhood. And it begins with an epigram from Leslie Marmon Silco that says, viewers are as much of a part of the landscape as the boulders they stand on. How Highway 83 scripts the pale grasslands at noon is home both driving the twists and arriving to silence and moon is home. Rattle of midnight machine guns across low hills, Fort Huachuca. Bedroom window, weaponized boyhood, sonic booms are home. Windmill decants the aquifer in squeaks and rusted rotations. Threaded water from the faucet, thirst weaving loom is home. The twisted cottonwood tree is older than the ghosts of Lokeel. The million green leaves, glittering, shredded BP costumes is home. Deputies wear cowboy hats. One puts a gun to Matt's teen skull. Cops carrying war zones, always sieging some Khartoum is home. Allison cups a hummingbird inside her slender, prayered hands. The iridescent bird heart and the sister touch a bloom is home. Driving out Hereford Road, dirt flats with Juan and Mike after our shift. Getting high in the single wide mountain of Mota living room is home. Standing in the checkout line, deciding which check language to use. No pues si que gusto en verte de verdad como estas tú is home. Electric can opener, whole wheat bread and flour tortillas. Nobody in the house calling them frijoles, only legumes is home. A death map, a cartography of concertina unspooled across organ pipe. Felipe walked north through here towards a Mexica heirloom home. Banks of the San Pedro near Tombstone, old frayed rope hangs, wanting to believe it's an old tire swing and not presume is home. My children running small, wordless, and human through the purple arroyo sunset. White children singing this land is your land in classroom before I bring them home. So I'd like to read a couple quarantine poems these are poems I haven't read really anywhere else, um, except maybe for once or twice on a, on a Zoom call here and there. Um, the first one was written in um, April. The second one was written um, just a couple weeks ago um, in September, and it was for uh, a, a virtual event, so it was a book festival in Cuernavaca. So the first one it's kind of early in quarantine and it's in English. And then the second one is um, later in quarantine, it's in Spanish. And um, the first one's called Desert Quarantine. Wherever water flows, a certain something will grow. Any wet, suddenly seedy, twisted with desert endemics. In scarcity, supply is another word for life. I carry by hand gallons of water across the desert garden, feeling the structure of my body tire from defying gravity, sweat evaporating as quickly as it appears, disintegrating clouds. Really, there's no such thing as weeds. There's just plants that I don't want to grow where they are growing. So I stoop to pull them one by one by one by one, fix the leak that's giving them a drink, then stumble towards my mason jar, pour all of it into me and survive. In quarantine, the long days burn at the desert earth that I carry inside me, an aridity of sand spilling from my mouth in isolation, a scarcity of distraction is a supply of life, is a choking tangle of weeds twisting, impenetrable bloom. All the unwanted tap-rooted parts of me I thought long uprooted back again, one by one by one by one 
by one, by one. Unas notas desde la cuarentena en Tucson. No escribo, no escribo, no escribo, no escribo, no escribo, es que no escribo, es que no, es que no, no es que escribo. Me dicen poeta, ¿qué tal si les digo que no escribo? Me busco, escucho, cómo escribir un mundo en flujo, es decir, que les digo, no hay poemas, hay muchas dudas, y aún así, cuando el mu mundo termina, habrá palabra todavía como yo existía antes de existir. Y así los poemas que van corriendo entre sueños de un futuro posible y pesadillas de otro futuro posible, entre la academia y la calle está su casa, donde vivo, trabajo, amo, cultivo, regaño, donde duermo, actúo, grito, hago ex ejercicio. Entre la ciudad y el desierto está su casa, está mi casa, donde sumeo en el Zoom, sumeando por aquí, por allá, tanto que sumeo hasta cuerna y luego a clase. Estoy en todas partes y no estoy en ningún lugar, como la pandemia, que estoy en to está en todas partes y ni se ve. Acá en mi desierto, el verano arde como nunca, mientras que todos los bosques se mutan en humo, humo que tinta el sol, quinto sol, color sangre, Color labio, color semáforo, todo frena. Estoy en todas partes, aún no me encuentro. No hay poemas, hay noticias. Estoy en casa y el mundo también. Y este país se está convirtiendo en lo que siempre ha sido. Digo que se ve bien claro cuando la policía tiene sus tanques y los doctores se vistan de bolsas de basura. La violencia que este país exporta ya está en casa. Las vidas negras importan y el destino de la gente negra será el destino de este país, como siempre ha sido. Estoy en casa y quiero estar en la calle. No hay poemas, hay gritos, virus. And it goes on for a while, but I'll stop there. Some notes from quarantine. Wrote after a residency in um, Patagonia, Arizona last summer, um, and it's called How I Mind Mars. Last fall, I remembered to watch the night sky while walking through my desert garden. I learned north for the first time and I felt small and irresponsible for not seeing sooner. Mars spun up there for months. We passed so close that he would follow me inside and right into my poems. I was lost, then fierce, cleaning zinc out from under my fingernails, shaking out the keyboard, a soft rain of silver. The weather turned, I paid less attention, did my job, lost in lead, gravity of the calendar, Orion set. Sometime in spring, hundreds of silver satellites were thrown up into low orbit. Astronomers said sky would never dark the same, but worldwide internet coverage would be blazing. When I looked again to check, Mars had spun out, gone, into the southern horizon, somewhere distant and invisible from the city, from the state of my birth. It was later, in summer, in a tilt of earth, I shot across the land in a dirty comet, traveled and happened again on Mars. He had thrown his body into the Patagonias, and the whole range blazed red when men had already gone after him at war with the mountains again in the name of the same old gods, in the name of new jobs. Up around the scars, they were blasting out star shine in the chain-linked mine, orbited by a concertina of private security trucks, all tires and faces soaked in red planet dust, tunneling along the veins, zinc-lead silver. Down in Patagonia, I stumbled dry river, walked orderly streets between mining trucks and tiny libraries. I complained of dim internet and drank. I wrote poems shot through with planets and police states, self-doubts and mine shafts. This town has been fighting over the mine so long. The bumper stickers faded almost illegible by the time the mine bought and sold again, opened finally tilting the earth and shaking it out a haze. In the cowboy bar, after midnight, with only Saturn watching, I danced lonely 
with the jukebox shaking and northless, star-eyed red, illegible body beaded with droplets of silver dripping puddles of zinc, zinc guilty as lead. I'll end with one um, from my first book, Sonoran Strange. Uh, this is a poem that, you know, after poems are around for a while, they kind of take on a life of their own. And uh, I haven't, sp I've spent a good amount of time pretty far away from this book. Uh, and so far, in fact, that a lot of the poems seem like they came from a different time and from a different writer even. Um, and this one, I read it again recently. And uh, it surprised me. This one is uh, called Puerto Lobos, and it's a small portrait of part of a um, fishing town on the coast of Sonora. Puerto Lobos, lost to clocks, swaying in tide, fish by night, sleep by day, ghosts of sharks circle the panga, population of wind, promised electricity. Shipwrecked on the coast, here where the land runs out. The continent is also an island. There's no way off of it. Some fishermen have shipwrecked inside themselves, run aground, only here because they are nowhere else. When the cell phone tower finally reached this far, the voices were unsure of what to say, but spoke anyway in the evanescent manner of humans. Local government, an empty elementary school and a police station of broken windows. The walls aren't so much walls as whatever they were before becoming walls, old fishing nets strung as fences after they become tired of killing, round bones of sea turtles stacked outside the door, hermit crabs trying on the glass of Coke bottles, desert cliffs falling into the sea, volcanic rocks reaching up through the waves, Acatillos holding up white plastic bags, surrender, litter of fish bones and bird bones and other skeletons in between. None of the ghosts in Lobos are people. Those have left by now. Lobos, last of the land, between sky and sea, the beach, the sand, tiny rocks, children of boulders, waiting to grow up into mountains. About Sonoran Strange as well, because that's when I met your writing. And um, this was your debut collection. And it was uh, voted as a, picked as a 2015 Southwest Book of the Year as a top pick. It's beautiful, it's, it's searing. Um, I, we loved it, <laughs> or I loved it. And, and, uh, and so, I w if you would, if you'd start and tell us a little bit about your, your background, and then we'll... Sure. So uh, I was born and raised in Cochise County, Arizona. Uh, my family lived in Tombstone when I was born, and then we moved um, outside of Sierra Vista in the foothills of the Huachuca Mountains when I was two, and that's where I grew up till I was 18. Uh, you know, ethnically, I'm Irish Slavic, I'm white. My family is white, um, but growing up in the U.S. Mexico borderlands, uh, it's a very, a very culturally mi mixed space and linguistically mixed space. And so, um, you know, I always spoke a bit of Spanish growing up and through high school, always tried to hang with my friends and things when they would code switch. Um, but uh, it wasn't really until uh, I was living in Flagstaff um, and at Northern Arizona University that I really had the opportunity to invest fully to be able to uh, speak and more importantly listen in the two languages of my homeland and uh, that experience which was at the same time as discovering uh, poetry writing um, and more importantly for me at that moment poetry speaking um, those experiences really allowed me to begin to understand um, my space in a way that I had never understood and um, also my inner world and my place in that space in a different way and uh, really kind of led me. That's where kind of the journey started. Uh, 
coming up through slam poetry movement, um, ended up living in Mexico City in Cuernavaca throughout most of the aughts and um, moved to Tucson in 2010, uh, right when SB 1070 had been passed, um, the racial profiling uh, legalization law in, tu in Tucson and in Arizona. And um, just really realized that I couldn't run from, uh, you know, the problems and the racism of my homeland um, and the complications of being white in this space that I really had to kind of dig in and work to create the world that I wanted to live in. And so um, that's been kind of the work of living and writing in Tucson um, for the last 10 years or so. I uh, used to tour quite a, extensively, uh, performance projects, DJ projects, teaching projects. Uh, but now these days I'm uh, co-parenting with my partner, uh, twin five-year-olds. And so especially during these times, um, you know, home life has become uh, just all the more important. And uh, that's really the project these days. Uh, right now I'm actually working on um, an MFA at the University of Arizona which I'm really thankful for the opportunity to um, slow down from touring and from parenting and have the space to really uh, figure out what comes next as far as writing goes. Is the MFA in creative writing or, or what, are, what are you pursuing there? It is, it's an MFA creative writing. I'm focusing, it'll be in poetry, although I'm spending a lot of my time working on nonfiction, creative nonfiction. Oh, cool. yeah, we were, we had a Leo Banks last week and um, or you coming up actually, but uh, we were talking about features and I, I was reading a lot, I've read a lot of your, of your nonfiction and it, you know, the, the beauty of, of, of the features like that is it can be very poetic. And, and so you, you know, it, I mean, that's what draws people in really, you know, without it, it's, it's a news article. <laughs> um, but I wanted to talk about Sonoran Strange because it's interesting what you said about, about how it seems like it, it's so, you're so far removed from it because it talks about the fragility of the desert and of the people and, and, and basically of both um, natives just being run over. And, and, you know, looking at that and your other poetry, um, you know, your stuff from 2005, the issues haven't changed. In 2005 to now, it's still the same. It, it's, we're, we're still saying the same thing. So, um, how do you think that, does that change your writing or does it bring a new intensity, uh, further intensity, or, or well, how do you think that affects your current writing? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I think what, um, you know, what the United States mainstream discourse is slowly waking up to now is something that we've always on the border seen firsthand, you know, um, like, uh, of, uh, there's a writer, uh, uh, Miller, who is a good friend of mine, Memo Miller, uh, who wrote a book called Border Patrol Nation. And that really, you know, posits the border, posits the idea that that which starts in the border space never stays in the border space. You know, and you saw that recently um, with the Border Patrol tactical units being deployed against peaceful protesters in Portland. Um, and, you know, the fact that that kind of uh, state violence has always been very present here. And now what's happening is that state violence is spreading to the rest of uh, the United States and kind of the, uh, the perilous state of personal liberty in the borderlands and the xenophobia in the borderlands have now become the xenophobia and the perilous state of uh, personal liberty in the entire United States as we kind of teeter in this pre-election moment between two very different, different destinies. And so, you know, it seemed in 20, 2005, you know, when we were protesting what was then the border wall, um, that, you know, it was that, that, you know, the idea, that adage, that the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice, that seemed so true then. And it seemed so um, much less complicated than it does now. Um, and now, you know, uh, it's because it's gotten worse and not better uh, and it stands to get much, much worse. Um, you know, I think that there's, there's uh, again, an awakening is a crossroads, right? An awakening can go either way. And so at this moment when we're finally having a national conversation about 
uh, the value of black life and protecting black life. And also at a moment when, you know, immigrant children are being kept in cages, uh, we really stand uh, a stark choice. And writing at this moment is very complicated for that reason, because the world is changing so rapidly and um, the world right now begs so much participation that it, uh, that reflection is difficult. You know, when I write, I'm always, I need a certain amount of um, space of remove to be able to start to process what it is that I'm experiencing. And right now there is no remove, right? Every notification on my phone, every, um, you know, every census killing at the hands of the police um, is just uh, a call to action and less of a call to writing for me. And so um, it becomes complicated to write. The new book is uh, that I'm working on now is much more personal uh, and much more based in my own lived experience than Sonoran Strange was. And um, I'm finding it really uh, helpful to, as I stay active and engaged, to also be able to find that remove in my space and kind of visit the wellspring of life that was, is childhood and um, my experience, my numinous experience of uh, the place that raised me. Will your message just get out there in a broader sense in, in features or in books than it would in a collection of poetry? Oh, okay. So by, by touring or by performing rather than publishing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, there's an immediate, immediacy and an accessibility to a performance that I've long been in love with, and um, that continues to be the case. Um, right now, also, I'm not performing much uh, because there's no live events, obviously, um, but also because I'm aware of my positionality, you know, as a white man and also, you know, at a different stage in my career than I was 10, 15 years ago uh, when I was kind of first coming up. And um, there's a lot of brilliant analysis happening right now by young uh, people of color, queer folks, people who are closest to the problems, right, and most affected by these issues. And so a lot of the projects over the last many years now have been about how I can support by creating platforms and um, avenues and modes and support modes and avenues for expression that already exist, rather than myself speaking into that space. And so um, I think, you know, what's most effective right now for me personally is, um, is uh, a lot of introspection and a lot of um, critique and also supporting systems that uh, provide more access to other folks that don't already have it to be heard in the space. Um, this this um, series turned out to be very regional. Um, it didn't start out that way, but uh, it, it did. Um, Arizona-based, basically, and, and Southern Arizona quite a lot. But, um, I, you know, there's a lot of, like we were talking international and national um, issues that can be addressed. But what is it, do you think, about the West and particularly the Southwest that, that draws so many voices that, that writers just keep coming back to you? Oh, it's, uh, you know, a combination and amalgam of so many things. Uh, I think it's the space. I think it's the clear horizon and the wide sky um, and the, uh, the urgency of survival in the desert, to be quite honest. I mean, uh, never is death more close at hand than, you know, just 15 minutes away from my house being lost in the desert without any water. And that's, you know, not an abstraction, that's a reality for thousands of people who have died in that space over the last uh, decade. And so, you know, there's an immediacy um, uh, to our, our mortality here that I think is generative in the sense of there's an urgency to life here and an urgency towards the impulse to life. And so I think that that can create, uh, that can create creativity. I also think you know, we are so rich in culture in this place, um, you know, and the border is, you know, deposited as a line of separation, but really, you know, growing up in the borderlands, um, you know, at its best, what the border does is it creates a space of blending and it creates a spectrum of experiences and, and culture and, and languages that, um, you know, creativity always comes in the mixing of different elements 
rarely does something come out of nowhere, right? It's always a new combination of something that exists. And so I think that, um, you know, humans have always moved through this space, indigenous communities, um, you know, current day um, Tohono Atham live on both sides of the border and uh, trade routes have run through here forever. And I think that east, west, north, west, north, uh, east, <laughs> north, south, east, west movement has, uh, you know, people carry with them stories when we move. And um, that combination of stories coming together in this space, I think is also very fruitful. Uh, I'd, I'd like to talk about the art and the craft of poetry for a little bit, um, certainly before we close. We, we haven't had the, um, haven't had much poetry conversation and, and I, it's an interesting form and and uh, so I'd like to talk about that and and how do you talk and how just basically the craft when when I've, I've written some you know Western poetry and and you never know you know where do you, where do you cut that line and, and how do you go about it do you put everything on the paper and then and then format it or how do you go about just crafting a poem well you know I when um, I have the fortune uh, to good fortune to work with uh, writers who are just kind of coming to the page for the first time. You know, I always pass along a piece of advice that was very helpful to me that came through a book by Allen Ginsberg when he said that uh, poetry is first thought, best thought. And, uh, you know, I took that as uh, an invitation to when it pops in your head, when the language comes, write it down on the page and don't worry about if it's a poem or if it's good or if it's bad or if it's in English or Spanish or, you know, any of these other kind of um, critiques, the self edits that we would make. And so for me, I really try to write as freely as possible. And, um, you know, as years go on, I recognize that indeed poetry isn't thought, right? And poetry that comes from thought uh, suffers from, <laughs> from the, co the confines of what it is that we can think, right? And poetry is beyond thinking it is the art form of uh, you know all i think all art is so much more based in the senses than it is in the intellect um, but it's poetry is a particularly difficult uh medium because um as others have expressed before it's an art form that is based in language of course that it's a that is a very thoughty <laughs> sort of thing so um you know i say write first edit later um and then uh write freely I never throw anything away and never crumple up a piece of paper and never do any of that kind of dramatic stuff. I just save as, you know, a new file and start to cut things and we were talking about and I don't know, I think you, I don't know how far you were if you were close to finish, but about, you know, editing and getting it on the line and such. Um, and I wanted to I wanted to talk about Gadsden and, and Sustina. And I, I'll have to admit, I didn't know what Sestina was. So we looked it up and, and it, it, you know, it, it's a poetry form. Um, and I love that poem. I love the image you talk about Gadsden when he signs the purchase and he's got a woman on each knee and he's almost too drunk to write, but oh, he was able to sign it. And it, it's a great poem. Um, it, it didn't look like, so tell me, tell me, so now we're talking about form. Why did that title and why that form? Um, that, you know, um, hold on, I got a jet passing overhead. <laughs> <laughs> also, also Arizona problems. You know, it's interesting. Um, when Leo Banks filmed, we'll, we'll cut all this. When Leo Banks filmed last week, he was talking about being in, um, in a canyon, uh, researching a piece um, on 9-11. And they were in this deep canyon, and it was quiet and beautiful. And two weeks later, you know, they, and then they come to the top, and there's, you know, this hysterical kid saying, my God, the world's coming to an end. Two weeks later, the photographer went back down there, and uh -huh. he said it was so noisy. He said it was on the, it was in the pathway of Sky Harbor. And the oh, day wow. after the Air Force, there were no, there were no planes. Right. And Wild. So, yeah, that was an interesting story he, he mm -hmm. told. But, yeah, it's just, anyway. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> so, so anyway, if you want to talk a little bit about Gadsden, if you remember it as well as I do, but <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, Gadsden in Sestina. It's a uh, Sestina is a form. It's uh, six 
um, stanzas of six lines each. Um, and traditionally, each line, uh, there's a series of six words that repeat at the end of each line. Um, and in that poem, I kind of tweak the form or remix the form a little bit. The in, repeating words aren't on the end of the line, but each line uh, does contain one word of the six that it repeats and transforms throughout the poem. Um, you know, form is often, uh, uh, often described as um, kind of a chance to, it gives, it gives structure to say things that are difficult um, because it is so limited and uh, so kind of circumscribed the, the possibilities uh, in the poem. And so that one was just a, a challenge that I had set for myself to tell this folk legend or, you know, just thing I heard growing up about how the border is where the border is and not anywhere else. Um, you know, that story of the woman on each knee was something I kind of heard growing, growing up. And so I was trying, I was experimenting with trying to, you know, do the work of any poem, which is to say a lot in very few words. And um, I thought the idea of like trying to translate um, kind of, an, you know, folk legend into such a defined form as a Sestina would be something interesting to try. Um, I want to talk a little bit about reading or being read to as the consumer, basically. I'm, I, I like having poetry in the car. I have a little bit of a commute. And, but, you know, I listen to Billy Collins and Ted Kuzer. And, you know, Kuzer I like a lot. You know, he's a, reach, a Midwestern guy. And, and, uh, and but I, I find poetry very soothing when I'm driving. And um, right now I'm listening to Colin McCann's short story collection, 13 Ways of Looking, which I guess is from a, 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 a Wallace Stevens um, poem. And if, if you were reading it, you would know that you're not reading poetry. But as you listen to it, your mind isn't doing this like you're reading. Your mind is doing this. And, and it's, it's beautiful. It, it, it's an incredible piece of work. and and. And I don't know if I would have enjoyed it as much reading it. And so I know that you perform. Um, what What do you think of the of the different dimensions as as having it read to you or listening to it than reading? It's a long question, but yeah, uh, you know, there's just I I think that there's so many possibilities in both forms, and I love both forms dearly. Um, and, you know, I don't think of it so much as a binary either of an either or sort of situation. I think it's both and. I, w I love my poems on the page and I love being able to bring them to a stage or to a, a conversation or, a, you know, circle around a, a campfire. And I think that uh, for me, the mark of a really, you know, exceptional poem is a poem that works well in all of those different modes. Not every poem is going to um, or is meant to, but... Um, a truly exceptional poem, I think, will. And so for that reason, I like to have poems memorized um, when I have the occasion to, um, because then poetry is so much more literally on the tip of the tongue and can be um, kind of in, a, in part of daily life, which I think is important. Um, and, you know, I th obviously there's such a fifth dimension, uh, fifth, sixth, seventh dimension when performing poems or listening to them. You know, and there's even a difference between video and audio and being in a space, in a live space as well. You know, there's something about the um, human presence, you know, that is so near and dear to my heart um, in a poetry performance when though I'm the one speaking and the audience may be in the position of listening, really the feeling of it for me as a performer is much more of an electrical circuit. And um, that's something I had experienced for years. And then just recently I re uh, read it described that way uh, by, uh, uh, by June Jordan. And it's also present in Audre Lorde. And I just find it so beautiful when I, you know, when I also find the words to, you know, said by someone else to name an experience that I've had, which is um, really the project of so much literature, right? And so in these times when we can't be in the same space together or when that's so difficult, it's something I'm missing a lot right now. Um, but uh, yeah, I have a lot to say about that, obviously. I love performing and I love reading. Um, yeah. And I think that they are both necessary. I am. Um... I know that you were, I, I met you before, but you're, you're a writer in residence um, at, at Pima um, 
County Public Library. And were you also a full-time resident at Patagonia or was that a, a shorter gig? That was a shorter residency. I was there for two weeks as part of the Southwest Field Studies program oh. and um, had a chance to uh, last. I actually had the opportunity to return uh, this summer as well, although obviously the circumstances were much different. Um, but in summer of 2019, I had the chance to live there for just two weeks and to work with Borderlands Restoration and uh, to just kind of experience that place, which is not where I grew up, but it's the same land that I grew up in and uh, a town that I've always, you know, passed through and spent time in. So it was a really welcome chance to kind of return to uh, more rural Arizona from this city where I spend so much time now. I haven't been down to Patagonia in a long time, but I, I, I love that area and hopefully they're not, you know, not um, developing it too much. Um, when you were, when you were at the residency, what kind of questions were you getting? Um, just in the, you know, uh, and what were your answers on that? What, what are people looking for when they're looking to, to write? Oh, the residency at the Pima County Public Library was such a blessing um, because it put, yeah, I got to listen so, to so many different voices and have so many different conversations and um, it really kept me on my toes because uh -huh. I never knew what it would be that someone wanted to talk about and how, you know, how I could be of help to their process. Uh, you know, I, my experience was that most people want to be heard. Most people have words um, and, and are you know, at some, some, they're at some point in the journey of discovering the power of word and uh, manifesting that. And uh, we're just looking for kind of, you know, next steps in a lot of cases, um, books to read, other things to think about. Um, but by and large, I think that they needed to be heard. They needed to have someone listen with close attention to what it was that they were, they were working on. And I think that that uh, just speaks volumes to, um, you know, the silencing that goes on in our society in general and specifically towards, you know, Latinx folks and Chicano, Chicanx folks and queer folks and those, of, uh, those folks who have been, you know, uh, kind of marginalized by mainstream society and not given the opportunity to be heard too often. Um, what, uh, so, so your, your career, you know, I know you're a DJ and you, and you do the performance stuff and, and, and the poetry and, and nonfiction. Um, what, is, what, is, what is the favorite, your favorite part of, of your writing line? And do you have anything, um, you know, memorable that you want to share with us? Oh, there's so much. <laughs> I mean, these days I, you know, I'm spending so much, I'm so happy to be spending so much time writing because I'm a writer who goes through very um, intense cycles of kind of not writing. Um, and when I'm, and I don't think of that as writer's block or as a negative thing, you know, I'm just focused on other, on other aspects of the process, uh, performing or touring or teaching. Um, but right now I am writing. And so right now I think my favorite uh, part of it is just, you know, already being an hour in to the work when the sun just comes up and comes to the east facing window of my office and um you know the poem is happening in real time and i'm just there to kind of help help it uh help it emerge and um that is a feeling like no other when the words are kind of flowing on their own and i'm kind of in in that state of flow as it's called uh something i just treasure so much and um so that's not a very, you know, exciting answer. I have lots of wild stories from touring and things, but um, really where I'm at right now is just that kind of solo space, that introspective space, um, really kind of letting um, more subtle and tender parts of me speak and um, really kind of, you know, always looking to do better and learn and listen. I know I, uh, when I write, I, I tend to edit as I go, which is a real, a real sentence stopper. And, uh, I was, um, with the, at a ranch and a, one of the, one of the cowboys there said he had a horse, an old horse that was dying. And, and, uh, I came home and, and I think within two hours I had written this poem, um, probably one of the better things I've written about this horse, just, you know, like, you know, folding down basically. And, and, uh, of course it was, 
you know, it meant a lot to me uh, uh, about him telling me that and, and the horse and such. And so it's nice when it comes out like that. <laughs> right. So much better that way. <laughs> um, so you mentioned some books and things that you talked, um, you mentioned to um, your people that came in for your residency. Do you have any go-to or do you recommend any specific to poetry, but even just in the writing craft in general that you recommend to people? Oh, so many, um, you know, and I always like, that's why I kind of really practice kind of listening first and listening to what people are interested in and what their creative priorities are, um, because it's so different for all of us. Um, but me personally, you know, um, I just return to books frequently. Uh, right now, I've been reading the collected works of Audre Lorde, um, and I really... I, admire so much her her ability for um, premonition really you know her ability to be writing then what was is so present for us now um, also in that category of presence I think is uh, Muriel Ruck, Ruckreiser uh, who is a poet started working in the 30s um, you know and and wrote a great book called the book of the dead um, about uh, it's kind of an early work of what gets called documentary poetics which is obviously something that interests me and um that's a book i return to and i'm interested in right now um and then you know a lot of uh uh you know i recently was also revisiting uh, the work of leslie marmon silko who's something someone i really respect and uh you know i find that returning to books over time one of the most beautiful things about them is that uh you know books are not set in stone they change over time um which is obviously us changing as we come to them as readers, as our life takes us in different ways and teaches us different things. Um, but I like returning to books and, and continuing to learn from them over time. Um, I will, we'll uh, end this, wrap this up with this last question. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Uh, what, what advice do you give? And I know it probably changes with everyone you talk to, but what, what kind of, what is the best advice you can give an aspiring writer? Um, I think the advice is for, you know, any writer at any time is, is write and don't worry about the reader. Don't worry about being, being read or getting published or anything like that. I think the, the, you know, who I can't remember who said that thing about you want inspiration to find you working, right? If you walk around and you wait for the poem to hit you upside the head, you're going to be waiting a long time, right? You want to be putting words on the page, whether or not they're good or bad or whatever, and then things will come of that, right? When inspiration hits, then you're working and you can, uh, you can, you know, harness it or kind of uh, tap into it before it passes you by. Um, so, I mean, the, the advice to writers is just to write, and that's something I'm telling myself as well as anyone else. And um, you know, always the adage about reading twice as much as you write is also very important. I think um, reading outside of our comfort zone, reading in that kind of learning zone that's kind of in between comfort and panic, that space right there where we're reading uh, folks who have had very different life experiences from our own and from different times and reading works in translation and reading works that we don't like all the way through, right? Um, reading with other people so as to have someone to kind of discuss and bounce ideas off with. I think um, all of those practices are critical as well. Um, to add on, here's another question. When you're not in school and you know, and life is fairly normal, do you have, do you have a discipline um, except when you're traveling where you will sit down, you know, you start at five and you write till 10 and it, no matter, you, know, you may go on, but you won't make it shorter, that kind of thing for your writing habits? Um, I actually do really thrive under structure and deadlines. I really um, need that um, as a writer because there's so many things to do in the world and so many urgent priorities and I need to kind of create the space where kind of the breath can be alone and the poem can slowly take shape. Um, and again, I go through cycles, so there's times when I'm not doing it, but um, I think I'm at my most productive when I'm in the chair at five with my cup of coffee and um, I'm there at least until 7.30 when the kids wake up or, you know, I'm good on days when it's possible uh, to just kind of stay there or once the words stop coming, then pick up a book and start reading. 
um, you know, on into the morning. But really, um, you know, I, I find I write the best when my conscious mind is still waking up, hasn't quite made it fully on yet. And so um, I try to start early in the morning. For some folks, that's late at night, but uh, for me, it's early in the morning. Well, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Um, are those chickens in the background? Yes, so we do have <laughs> the homestead over here. That have been homestead. I've got a few, too. I, I, I love my chickens. They're very, very soothing. <laughs> we should write home about that. Oh, it's probably been done. Thank you, Logan. I appreciate it. Thank you, Vicki. I appreciate it. It's been great seeing you. Likewise. Take care. You too.